Welcome to Organic Chemistry, the first semester of Organic Chemistry. I'm Alan Headley. I'll be presenting these video lectures. So let's begin. First, let us define organic chemistry and organic compounds. Organic chemistry is really the study of compounds that contain mostly carbons and hydrogens. Mostly. Let us look at two organic molecules here that you're familiar with. This one is DEET. As you know, that is the insect repellent. So it has carbons and hydrogens. Looking at this as drawn, you do not see the symbol C because in organic chemistry we communicate carbon because they have so many by using lines and angles. So here is an angle which shows that there is a carbon there. Here is another one. So this is a carbon with hydrogen. And here is a carbon. So we'll learn more about that as we go through this course. But the bottom line is that for each intersection, at each intersection, there is at least a carbon. Notice for these molecules here, there is, in addition to carbon, there is oxygen and nitrogen. So for DEET, which is an insect repellent, it has oxygen and nitrogen. For ibuprofen, which is, of course, as you know, it's a painkiller, it has a bunch of carbons, as you can see through by these intersections here, and it also has oxygen, two oxygen atoms. So again, since organic chemistry is the study of compounds that contains mostly carbons and hydrogen, compounds that contain other atoms, these atoms are referred to as heteroatoms, different. So it's different from carbon and hydrogen. So you will find organic compounds with heteroatom. These are typically nitrogen, oxygen, the halogens, chlorine, and of course sulfur, and some others. But that's the study that we're going to encounter for the next um, few weeks. Before we get into the actual study of organic molecules, however, let us look at some of the basic concepts that you studied in general chemistry. And I know you, you have all mastered your general chemistry course because you are here taking organic chemistry. So let's do a quick review of the electronic structure of the atom. A term that's used a lot in organic chemistry and in chemistry is the term orbitals. So let us define that because as we go through our course, we'll introduce new terms. And I will emphasize and, and, and make sure that we explain and understand these terms because I will be asking you to apply these concepts to solve different problems. So orbitals are regions outside of the nucleus most likely to find electrons. So just imagine here you have your atom. Of course, as you know from Gen Chem, the simplest structure of the atom is a, a nucleus, which is at the center, which has, of course, the protons and the neutrons. And outside of that, in space outside of that, is the orbital, is, are the electrons. But specifically, these electrons are not randomly distributed, but they are found in specific regions in space, outside the nucleus, and these specific regions are known as orbitals. Another aspect of orbitals is that they have different sizes. So you have some that are pretty large, 
and some that are pretty small. We'll also use energies to describe the large or the small orbitals. Another feature of orbitals is that they have different shapes. So what we'll see is that they're not all the same in shape, but they have different shapes. So what I have here is just an illustration of different shapes of a sphere. So we have here a, a, a marble. Um, which is pretty small. Notice it's spherical. I'm emphasizing spherical. It's not a circle. It's a sphere, three-dimensional sphere. And a golf ball, of course, that's larger, and a tennis ball that, that's even larger, and, of course, a baseball that's even larger. So the take-home lesson here is that you have spheres that have different sizes. Same with the orbitals. In this case, though, the orbital that is spherical is described as the S orbital. So the S orbital is spherical. Notice it's not a circle. It's a sphere, three-dimensional sphere, and they have different sizes. So this would represent here a slice through the atom, showing the S orbitals. Notice again, because it's a sphere, a slice through it is like taking an orange and taking a knife and cutting right through the center. What you'll see here is the nucleus, which of course, as we said earlier, has the protons and neutrons. And outside of that, you'll find the orbitals. The orbitals, one type orbital that you'll find is the S orbital. Notice that it's a sphere because you've cut a line right through the center. They are different in sizes, so we use different numbers here to represent the size. The 1S is small and close to the nucleus. The 2S is larger and further from the nucleus compared to the 1s. And as you can imagine, the 3s is even larger, still spherical, but further from the nucleus. Another type orbital that we'll encounter frequently in organic chemistry is the p orbital. So this is a different type orbital, so we have to give it a different description. P. The shape of this is not spherical, but it looks like an hourglass. Or when you go to the gym and you pick up those weights, some folks describe it as a dumbbell because you have two weights on either side of the middle. So you have a large end on either side of the nucleus. So this represents the P orbital. Notice it's not spherical. It's like an hourglass, up and down. What I've drawn here is two p orbitals. Notice difference in size here. So the 2p, as you can imagine, is close to the nucleus. And the 3p is further from the nucleus. Notice there's no 1p. So there's not a 1p orbital. It starts at 2. So the 2p orbital is smaller close to the nucleus, compared to the 3p orbital, which is larger and more diffused compared to the 2p orbital. Next, because the p orbital is one-dimensional in terms of its pointing, it's possible to have three in three-dimensional space. So these p orbitals can point in the x direction, it can point in the y direction, and it can point in the z direction. You may remember the x, y, and z are the three coordinates of three-dimensional space that you did in your math class. So because these orbitals are in three-dimensional space and not just 
as shown on a piece of paper, which is two-dimensional, we'll have to use something like this x, y, and z to represent it. So take a moment to look at this. Notice this is two-dimensional drawing of a three-dimensional representation x, y, and z. So, what we have here is a very cumbersome picture of all the orbitals that we have discussed so far and the nucleus. So that would be an atom with the orbitals around it. So here we have the nucleus, which has the protons and neutrons. We have the 1s which is close to the nucleus. Notice it's a spherical, so this is a slice through the atom. Just again, as I mentioned, like a slice through an orange. You can see the interior of the orange. The 2s is a little larger and further from the nucleus. Again, we know that because of the numbers here. 1 versus 2. Here is the p orbital. Notice again we have the PX, the PY, and the PZ pointing in the three coordinates of three-dimensional space. Again, we have to use 2 and 2 and 2 for these because they are equal in size, which means they have the same size, which means they're equal in energies. We'll see later on that 2 represents the principal quantum number. So in chemistry, as you can imagine, this representation that's on top is very cumbersome to draw. So we won't ask you to draw that because it requires an artistic representation. So what we typically do is we have a different representation here which is the same as above. So here we have the 1s. So this represents here the 1s orbital. The 2s, which represents the 2s orbital. 2px, which represents the 2px, 2py, 2pz, and the 3s, which is not drawn, but as you can imagine, it is there. This is called the electronic configuration. So, from here on, what we'll use essentially is the electronic configuration whenever we talk about the atom with its electrons and orbitals and not the pictorial representation that's above. As you can imagine, it's much easier to use the electronic representation, electronic configuration, which is shown below. Next. You will need your periodic table, and as I pointed out in the previous video, the introductory video, a periodic table is a must for this course. So hopefully by now you've gone to the internet and downloaded your periodic table. This is your periodic table. You will use it when you take your quizzes. You will use it when you take your exams, because it becomes a tool of chemistry. It becomes a tool of organic chemistry that you'll use in solving these various problems that we'll ask. So let us look at an example of the numbers and what's written on a periodic table. I'll review your uh, memory of this. Here is hydrogen. So this H represents a symbol. Of course the name is written there. But the most important thing for us in organic chemistry is this number. Notice it's an integer. It's a counting number. One. That represents the number of electrons, also known as the atomic number. This represents the atomic weight. Notice this is not um, a, a integer. It's not a counting number because it has decimals to it. That represents the average weight of hydrogen including the isotopes that's found in nature, the natural abundance. For us, for this 
chapter we'll concentrate mostly on the atomic number because that's the number of electrons another example carbon has six electrons so if I were you I'd pause this video look at your periodic table and look at different atoms on the periodic table and see if you can determine how many electrons are in the different atoms look at oxygen for example how many electrons are there in oxygen look at fluorine how many electrons are there in fluorine what we'll do here is we'll use the electronic configuration here to write the electrons into the orbitals so if you notice here this is what we had before 1s 2s 2px 2py 2pz and 3s that represented that cumbersome three-dimensional picture that we're trying to draw so once again whenever you see this in chemistry it's representing something and that's why sometimes in chemistry we say it's hard, but it's not. It's just understanding how we communicate. We communicate here by numbers and letters and subscripts and superscripts. But they all mean something. So we'll have to make sure that we understand the meaning of that so that we can apply that knowledge to solving chemistry problems. So first, hydrogen has one electron, as you can see from the periodic table. The question now is where is that one electron in this series of orbitals that we have described earlier? You know from Gen Chem that you occupy that electrons occupy the lowest energy orbitals. The lowest energy here would be the one that has one. So it's a 1s. That's that's the lowest in energy. So the electron goes into the 1s orbital. Notice that the electron here is shown using a superscript. These are zeros. You don't have to write them in because they're unoccupied. So another way of writing this is 1s1. That's hydrogen atom. Let's look at another atom. Carbon has six electrons. How do we know that? Look at your periodic table. You can see that there are six electrons in carbon. Notice that we have the same set of orbitals that are available to carbon as to hydrogen. So now we have to put these six electrons in. Of course, as you remember from Gen Chem, Chem there are rules. First rule that you need to remember is that there is a maximum of two electrons per orbital. So here is a 1s orbital. 1s orbital. Only two electrons of the six can go there. So we put a two right here. Here is another orbital, 2s. Only two electrons can go there, not three, not four, only two. So we use a superscript to put that, to indicate that there are two electrons in that orbital. Okay, we have used the four electrons here, so we have two more. Next, we have the 2px, 2py, and 2pz orbital. We mentioned earlier that they are equal in energy. A term that we'll use a lot here is they are degenerate orbitals. We, you should remember from your Gen Chem that if you have degenerate orbitals, electrons go in each orbital before they are paired. So since we have two electrons left over, one electron goes into one of the orbitals and the other goes into the other p orbital. The way I have it written here as the x and y and the z vacant because they are equivalent, I could have done it differently. I could have put one here, and I could have put one over here, and zero here. Same, because they are degenerate.
and of course we only have six electrons so we cannot put any more electrons here all these numbers here must add up to six another way of writing this without including all the orbitals and contracting the p orbitals into one term the 2p notice no subscripts here so now we have 1s2 2s2 and 2p2 six electrons representing carbon i won't go into much details here but as you can imagine seven electrons for nitrogen you should be able to put these seven electrons in these orbitals so as you can see here now we have one two and three electrons in each of the p orbitals and of course another way of writing this is like this oxygen is another example so we have eight electrons here so your job is to put these eight electrons into these orbitals here and do not violate any of those rules two electrons per orbital if the orbitals are degenerate you need put only one electron in each orbital before you start pairing and you start by putting electrons in the lowest energy orbital so here is another way of writing it in terms of contracting the p orbital so notice no subscript here because that just represents all three orbitals which contains the four electrons what I like to do is to make sure that you understand that concept and this is a typical question that you'll get in your multiple choice for the quiz and on the exam so the question is what is the ground electronic state configuration of carbon so I'm underlining the keywords here ground state here just means the one that's shown on the periodic table electronic configuration here means that you use in the format that we have described 1s2 2s2 that type of thing so which is the correct one that's a loaded question because now you have to make sure that you do not violate any of those three um, rules that we have for populating the the orbitals and you have to make sure that you've used enough electrons that so means you have to look at the periodic table and determine how many electrons are there in carbon and put them in so let's look at the first one this one is two that looks reasonable two is two zero hmm that rings a, that 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 doesn't sound like um it, it it's going to be on the correct trend and here is two p four means that we have six electrons here so we have used up the six electrons but we did not populate the orbital based on the lowest energy to the highest energy because we have bypassed 2s so that's a problem there b we have here two electrons that looks good but here we have three electrons in our 2s hmm. problem there because there's a maximum of two electrons per orbital let's look at C that looks good two and two that's a possible possibility how about this one one is three hmm the three s orbital the one s orbital only takes a maximum of two electrons so there's a problem here this looks reasonable and that looks reasonable but there's a problem with the first one with the 1s3 let's look at this one we have here 1s2 looks good 2s2 looks good 2p3 looks good but the problem is how many electrons do we have here 3 4 5 6 7 this add up, adds up to 7 electrons so if I were you I would pause this video right here and see if you can determine which is the best answer notice the answer for this is not just what is the answer you will have to apply what we have just discussed to come up with a best answer for this 
The answer that we have selected here is this one. That's the best answer because it does not violate any of those rules that we have done before. What you may want to do also is as you study your organic chemistry or this section of it is on a quiz, quiz question I may ask you not carbon because I know you know carbon but I may ask you what is the electronic configuration of nitrogen and of course give you different possibilities here and here and here and you will have to select the best answer so the best way to study this material is to manipulate what you've learned to form different questions and see if, see if you can use the information to solve it. That's why it takes time to study organic chemistry. That's why it takes time because it's a lot of practice. It's a lot of practice. Okay, let's look at another concept called the valence electron. Um, let's first of all define valence electrons and why they are so important. Valence electrons are the electrons in the outermost shell of an atom. Outermost. So in other words, it's electrons that's furthest from the nucleus. Furthest from the nucleus. The electrons that are closest to the nucleus are called the core electrons. And we use the word shell here because that will be the orbitals with the same principal quantum number. So make sure, take a second here to absorb that definition. Valence electrons, automo shell, the shell with the same principal quantum number. Those are the valence electrons. Notice that term carefully because they're different from the core electrons, which are the electrons closest to the nucleus. Why are they so important? As we'll see later on, the valence electrons, because they're furthest from the nucleus, are the electrons that are used in bonding. They are the electrons that will be used in reactions, not the core. So it's very important to determine the valence electrons. Notice they're different from the total number of electrons in an atom. So let's look at these examples. Hydrogen has one electron, and it has one orbital that has that one electron, so therefore there's one valence electron. Simple, because it has just one electron. Let's look at something that's more complex. Carbon, six electrons. We know that this is the electronic configuration of carbon, but this now represents the outermost shell because they have the same principal quantum number two which is furthest from the nucleus. Remember we said earlier that the principal quantum number two or the number before the letter represents the energy or how far these orbitals are from the nucleus. This one is here is has a one that means it's right close to the nucleus that represents the core. So these two electrons here are in the core, and these four are valence electrons. So if you asked, how many valence electrons are there in carbon? It is four. How many electrons total are there in carbon? There are six. There's a difference. Um, let's just quickly go through this. So nitrogen has seven electrons from the periodic table. You do your electronic configuration here. You'll see that these five electrons here are in the outermost shell, and that's the valence electrons. And these two electrons here are in the orbital closest to the nucleus with a different principal quantum number one. So that's the core. So you should be able to look at oxygen and tell that it has six valence electrons and two core electrons to make a total of eight electrons in the atom. Okay, let us apply that to another aspect here. Lewis dot structure. Of course, as you know, in chemistry, especially organic chemistry, we're always trying to find an 
easy way to communicate concepts. So one way of communicating the number of valence electrons around an atom is to use what we call the Lewis dot structure. The Lewis dot structure. G. N. Lewis was a chemistry chemist, chemist professor. I think he was at Berkeley years ago. So he devised this way of communicating this concept that we've just discussed in the previous slide. And what he proposed is write the atom, the symbol for the atom H, and use a dot to represent the valence electrons. So hydrogen has one valence electrons as electron, as you know, and so to write that is H dot. Carbon, on the other hand, has six electrons total, but it has four valence electrons. Notice the difference. Valence electron. So the Lewis dot structure is the symbol carbon here, and it has four dots around it. One, two, three, four. Each dot represents a valence electron. We have more examples here, so we just quickly go through this because I'm pretty sure you have the concept now. If you're asked to write the Lewis dot structure of nitrogen atom, which means determine how many valence electrons are in nitrogen. You quickly determine that's five based on the electronic configuration. And then you write the symbol N and put five dots around it. Same for oxygen. Eight electrons total, but six valence electrons electrons as we can see from this electronic structure. So if you're asked to write the Lewis dot structure of oxygen, you put the symbol oxygen here and six dots around it. Try to make the dots as symmetrical as possible um, around that atom. Okay, so you have six dots. So notice again, writing a structure like this is much easier than writing this electronic configuration and much easier than doing the pictorial by drawing the different orbitals. So again, as chemists, this is the way we communicate. By writing this structure here, we see a lot or we envision a lot in terms of the structure by just looking at that. Lewis dot structure. Just to make sure you understand this and can apply this concept, here's a question for you. A typical question that you probably would get on a quiz or on an exam. How many valence electrons are there in boron, carbon, and oxygen respectively? Which means that you have to get your periodic table and quickly look at that periodic table and determine how many valence electrons, valence electrons, not total e electrons, how many valence electrons are there in each of these atoms. And then you'll have to pick the correct answer. So my suggestion again is pause this video at this point, get your periodic table, and write down the valence electrons and see which one matches. The next slide has the best answer. So here this would be the best answer because boron has three valence electrons, five total electrons. Carbon has four valence electrons, six total electrons, two core and four valence. And of course oxygen has six valence electrons. So again, you should be able to utilize the concepts of Lewis dot structure valence electrons to, to apply that to solving different problems. Okay, let's continue. So, let's look at the um, bonds in chemistry. 
Um, so what we have here is, of course, as you know from Gen Chem, there are basically two bond, two types of bonds in chemistry. The bonds here are, 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 are the glue that physically hold the atoms together. So we have um, a, an ionic bond. And later on we'll see the covalent bond. So let's quickly look at the ionic bond. This is the bond that's used a lot less in organic chemistry. They're formed typically between atoms at the extreme ends of the periodic table. A very electronegative atom and a very electropositive atom. You may recall that uh, electronegativity here is a tend to pull electrons towards itself. The more electronegative atoms are the atoms up at the top right of the periodic table, which of course, as you know, is fluorine is the most electronegative. And of course, the other end is the electropositive atom. So in this case here, let's look at lithium. If lithium should lose an electron to become lithium plus, which is a, if it's a cation, it's charged because it has lost an electron. So we have a lithium cation over here. And if we have another atom, fluorine, very reactive, if it should gain an electron, which means a negative charge. So now we can see that gained electron is in the 2p orbital. So it goes from 5, 2p5, to 2p6. But most important here is that fluoride becomes a fluoride anion. So we have an ionic bond because we have lithium plus cation and fluorine negative and anion. So because Opposites attract, we have lithium plus, fluorine negative, we have an ionic bond. Why ionic bond? Because these are two ions. A cation and an anion attracting to each other to form a very strong bond. For organic chemistry, however, the bond that we'll use the most or we will see the most is the covalent bond. And of course, as you know from your Gen Chem, the covalent bond is the bond where the electrons between atoms are shared. So because of the sharing of electrons, that's the glue that keeps atoms together. That's the glue that keeps the atoms together. So let's look at some terms. So we have the first term here is the covalent bond. That's the glue, is the shared electrons. Next term is the valence electrons, which we know what that means. Those are the electrons in the outermost shell. Those are the electrons that will form the covalent bond. Now you can see the importance why we stressed knowing how many valence electrons are there in an atom. And of course, the other term that we are familiar with is the Lewis dot structure. So what we'll do here is we'll use the Lewis dot structure to sh illustrate or show covalent bonds between molecules. The example here is methane, CH4. So what we have here is carbon that has four valence electrons. We know that from the periodic table. Hydrogen has one valence electron, which we just discussed. So one of these electrons is coming from hydrogen, and the other electron is coming from carbon. So that's why we have eight electrons around carbon, four valence electrons from one carbon atom, and four valence electrons from each of the hydrogen atoms. So this becomes the Lewis dot structure of methane. Lewis dot structure of a molecule. Notice this is not the atom, but this is of the molecule. So again, I um, point out here the, um, um, the, the methane here has a total of eight valence electrons. So the total of eight valence electrons 
for the complete molecule. Four from carbon and four from each of the hydrogen, making a total of eight valence electrons. Just want to emphasize, we look at valence electrons per atom. Now this is valence electrons per molecule, which means the sum of all of the valence electrons per atom. Okay, let's apply that to another molecule here. So this represents here the Lewis dot structure of carbon dioxide, showing the bonding electrons. So first you need to calculate how many valence electrons are there in carbon dioxide CO2. You look recognize that it has 16 valence electrons total, which means carbon. You go back to your periodic table, you determine how many valence electrons are there in carbon. And notice it's CO2, so you determine how many valence electrons are there in oxygen. Multiply that by 2, because there are 2 oxygen atoms. And the sum of that will be the total valence electrons for that molecule. For that molecule. So you arrange those 16 valence electrons around CO2 so that the octet rule is obeyed. You may recall the octet rule from Gen Chem, where each atom has a maximum of 8 electrons. And after you've done that, you will get a structure like this, as shown here. Or another way of using it is using lines to represent the bonding electrons. So we have here bonding electrons and non-bonding electrons, two terms that we'll use frequently throughout this course, non-bonding electrons and bonding electrons. But this is the Lewis dot structure of carbon dioxide. The textbook has more examples and, 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 and a method to work this out. So once again, I want to remind you that these lecture videos here are not designed to substitute for reading the textbook. They're designed to complement your reading the text. So a lot of times, sometimes you may have um, questions from reading the text and um, these lecture videos may shed some light or clarification on those. So please don't forget that. You must read the text because it's a lot more detailed than these lecture videos. So it's an application here is how many valence electrons, valence electrons are there in this molecule? That's a loaded question. Because now you have to determine how many atoms are in that molecule, how many valence electrons per atom, and add them up. So once again, I would suggest pausing your video at this point, getting your periodic table, and determine how many electrons, valence electrons are in the carbon, how many valence electrons are in the hydrogen, in hydrogen, times three, of course. How many valence electrons are there in nitrogen? And how many valence electrons are there in oxygen? Of course, times two. And you add that up and see which one of these matches that sum. The next slide has the answer. So well, once you turn on your video again to run, you would see that I ended up here is the best answer is 24. So you should get 24. So this is a classic question of the type you will get on the quiz and on the test. Multiple choice. So what you may want to do is, instead of using this molecule, look through the book or on the web or anywhere, come up with a different molecule and calculate how many valence electrons they are. On the test or on the quiz, of course, I will not ask you for this molecule again because we know you know it. 
because we're not asking you to reproduce information here. We're asking you to apply the information that we have studied. Okay, let's look at the shapes of molecule. Another review from your Gen Chem. Um, if you have your Lewis dot structure and it looks like this, it's described as linear because you know from the Vesper theory, valence shell electron pair repulsion theory is that electrons be negative. They want to get as far apart from each other as possible. So here we have electrons and here we have electrons. And so these electrons over here will try to get as far apart from these electrons over here. And the only way to do that is directly opposing each other which means a linear. Another example here is formaldehyde. So you can see that because we have electrons now here and here and here, the geometry that this molecule assumes is a trigonal planar. So go back and refresh your memory of that. And of course, another example here is good old water molecule, H2O. This is the Lewis dot structure of, Lewis, of, of water. However, the geometry is bent, even though it's three atoms, like carbon dioxide, three atoms, but it's not linear because these electrons here are in orbitals. These electrons here are in an orbital, and they will repel each other based on the Vesper theory. So the geometry that's assumed based on the repulsion of all these electrons is a bent geometry. Some more examples here. Um, again, this is, you may need your model set for this, but this is carbon, which has hydrogen, hydrogen, and hydrogen, and hydrogen. But these bonding electrons here and here, and here, and of course here, so there are four pairs of bonding electrons. They want to get as far away as possible from each other. So as you can see, as drawn, it looks like a flat geometry, but it's not. It's in the form of a tetrahedron, or tetrahedral geometry. Another example is this. Again, these bonding electrons here and these bonding electrons here want to get as far as possible from each other. So they go ex to the extreme, exactly opposite to each other. Meth um, ammonia is, is a pyramidal because, of course, you have to take into account these electrons and, of course, the bonding electrons to nitrogen and oxygen getting as far away as possible based on the Vesper theory and the geometry is a pyramidal. Notice the geometry only includes the atoms. The electrons that are shown here dictates the geometry but it's not a part of the geometry. It's a solid atom that is the geometry itself. The polarity, bond polarity, another concept from Jen Kim here is shown here. So we have here carbon dioxide. This is called a covalent bond, of course, as you know. But in addition, it's a polar covalent bond. Why polar? Because oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. So these bonding electrons here are attracted more towards the carb, the oxygen than the carbon, hence a partial negative to indicate that partial attraction. So that's called a polar covalent bond. Same here, polar covalent bond. So this molecule is nonpolar, as you can see in the book, that this symbol is also used to describe polarity of bonds. Since they are equal and opposing each other with a 180 degree angle, 
that molecule is described as a nonpolar molecule. So you'd have to take the geometry and the po bond polarity into account to determine if a molecule is polar or not. Let's look at another example here, water. You know that water is a polar molecule. Why is it a polar molecule? First of all, it's bent. And of course, these bonds here are polar covalent bonds, right? Because oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen. So it has a partial negative charge. So therefore, the hydrogen is partial positive. So it's a polar covalent bond. Notice the geometry. They are not pointing in opposite direction, but they are actually pointing in a direction that reinforces that geometry. So therefore, this is described as a polar molecule. As you can see here, that geometry and the polarity reinforces each other. So you should be able to predict if a molecule is polar or not based on your knowledge of the Lewis dot structure, the bond polarity, and the geometry. Okay, so here I think this is pretty much the last slide, but let's see. So here's a test of that. Good multiple choice question. Good, good, good test of the concept here is which of the following would you expect to be polar? In other words, which has the largest dipole moment? Notice the wording. Sometimes we use different wording, but you just have to understand that wording. So which is the most polar molecule? So notice the way it's written here. These molecules are written as chemical formulas, letters and subscript. To us, we need to visualize or draw out the Lewis dot structure, the geometry, the bond polarity, and determine if it's a polar molecule or not based on the bond polarity and the geometry. So draw this one out. Draw this one out. Draw this one out. And draw this one out. So you may want to pause the video at this point. Draw them out. And then check your answer. The next slide has the possible answer. So the possible answer here is this molecule. You can see that it's tetrahedral. After you draw it out, it's tetrahedral, where they, there's, there are three bond polarities here that are different, which is the CH3 bond polarity, because chlorine is a very electronegative atom compared to hydrogen. So therefore, the bond polarity there is a lot compared to the bond polarity to the CH. And since it has a geometry that's tetrahedral, the bond polarity reinforces each other and it has a dipole moment or it's a polar molecule. So as a practice, what you may want to do is check in the textbook. There are other examples. Draw out your molecules and determine if it's a polar molecule or not. So as you can imagine, on the test or on the quiz, I will have the same wording here, same wording, but different molecules. So it's just a matter of making sure you know the concept and making sure you can apply the concept. So that's the end of the first lecture video here. Um, so continue reading in your text as you follow along with these lecture videos. Again, a reminder, this is not a substitute. You will have to read your text and come up with different problems, solve the problems in your text, and um, use this as a supplement. So I will post the next video shortly, which is also on Chapter 1. So continue to study hard and We'll see you or talk with you in the next lecture 